This video is brought to you by Babbel. Close your eyes and picture a restaurant. What images spring to mind? Maybe you see your local spot uh, where a friendly bartender is sliding your order over as soon as you walk in. There's a game on TV and the regulars who you know are patting you on the back and making jokes about the old ball and chain. Or maybe you're behind the bar. It's pretty sticky back there and you're surrounded by 10 dirty shot glasses, which are nestled besides a giant vat of hot fries, and there's agitated customers just, just snapping their fingers at you, demanding refills. Now, if you pictured the latter example, then congratulations, you've worked a service job before. And, and fingers crossed that you made enough tips to pay your rent. Hopefully you're lucky enough uh, not to be the Uber driver who got attacked with a knife in Omaha, or the flight attendant who was punched on a plane in Dallas, or the Virginia Waffle House waitress who got beat up by customers or the Burger King drive through worker who had a gun pulled on him for a, get this guy's offering the customer a promotional discount on his breakfast. But also, honestly, bravo, because nothing is more American than using a gun to threaten someone for trying to give you a free handout, you know? Eat these bullets, breakfast communism. But you don't have to be physically or mentally abused by a customer to know that service work sucks. There's the slew of demanding apps monitoring a delivery person's every move, or the five-star rating system that's spread to airport bathrooms, or the endless customers who are very Popeye post-spinach. All told, it feels pretty safe to say that there's never been a worse time to have the job of providing service with a smile. But why are things so bad right now? Was this race to the bottom of terrible customer behavior inevitable? And what does it say about our society when an Amazon driver has to pee in his water bottle just so that you can get your galaxy light projector in time for the black light frat party? I hope it was worth it, Blake. So you can have your fun party, Blake. Hope it's a fun time, Blake. Do your homework. But hey, let's be brave and dive in. We'll explain precisely how the shift took place after the break, but for now, I wanna talk about this video sponsor, Babbel. Now, summer's quickly approaching, and for lots of us, this means summer vacation. And what better way to get ready for backpacking across Europe than with Babbel? Right now, I'm using Babbel to learn Danish, I've said this before, but I learned a little bit of Danish in grad school, but it was more about reading 19th century philosophy and not actually talking. Now, Babbel is a language learning app that is scientifically proven to help you start speaking a new language in three weeks. All their lessons are designed by real language teachers, not algorithms, so you can learn using real world conversations. And hey, uh, wouldn't you know, it's just about time for my daily lessons. So let's get into it. Jeg hedder Finn. Jeg Hither Finn. That's pretty close. I'll finish the rest of this later, okay? But I just wanted to show you how easy it is to learn a language with Babbel. Now, after just a short time, you know, I'm already out here using phrases like, Hi, yay, hello, Michael, for our toilet. In a few weeks, I won't have to follow that one up with a tala du angles. Join me in learning a new language from Babbel, one of the top language learning apps in the world. And when you click the link in the description, you're gonna get 60% off your subscription. And if you don't love it as much as I do, then don't even worry about it because Babbel offers a 20 day money back guarantee. Let me know in the comments what language you're gonna learn from Babbel and maybe where you're gonna travel after you learn that language. And now, let's get to the bottom of this room temp chalupa. Now back in the day, it would have been really hard to imagine assaulting the clerk at your local store because it's probably owned by a family you'd known for years and went to church with. But the dream of owning your own business was already fading around 1877, by which point two thirds of American workers were wage laborers for larger companies. That number grew to around 80% by the mid 1900s. Now this had lots to do with the emergence of chain stores, especially in cities after World War I. You know, cause that's the worst part about World War I was those gosh darn chain stores. As they flourished, providing a good customer experience became essential to standing out. And this made service workers enthusiasm and loyalty paramount. The same period also saw what one historian has called the degradation of work. As most everyday jobs in an ever industrializing nation became more demanding and less satisfying. As World War II ushered in the consumption happy middle class, we saw the emergence of the mall filled with well-lit shops and staffed by employees who would, by the turn of the millennia, be stripped down to their undies and doused in cologne. Now, if you're younger and you're thinking to yourself, what horrible world did you grow up in, Michael, where that happened? This is pretty normal. You know, late 90s, early 2000s, you go to the store Abercrombie and Fitch, and there'd be a kid standing outside, truly a kid, wearing like a swimsuit and stuff. It was normally a guy you went to high school with, and you're thinking like, how does he look like that? And I look like this. But then you would think, oh, when I grow up, I'm gonna have a body like that. 
and then you're in your late 30s and you still got basically the same body. The gradual shift from owning your own shop to standing around in a spray tan has made service work a weird, if highly populated space in society. Because it doesn't typically require specific technical knowledge, it's treated as unskilled. How intelligent do you have to be to take a food order? And that's despite the fact that holding five plates at once is harder than any single thing I've ever been paid to do. The worst job I've had, at least recently, is when I interned um, at a comedy theater in Los Angeles. I was in my 30s when this happened, and I would get up on Sunday mornings and go clean toilets and bathrooms at this comedy theater because somehow that was that was good and it gave me credits to take classes at the comedy theater. If you're thinking right now, it sounds like Michael's in a weird comedy cult. Looking back, that's what it felt like. It was it was it was bad, but I did get really good at cleaning bathrooms and toilets. So when this all falls apart, if any of you are really rich and have like 12 bathrooms. Hire me, I'll be your guy. I'll keep your toilets very clean. Add to that that service work is de facto gendered as feminine, as well as often being relegated to people of color, which leads to an unspoken expectation that service workers be cordial and hospitable, which as we all know is, is just natural to the gals, right? In fact, the term emotional labor was coined by sociologist Arlie Hochschild to describe the phenomenon of controlling the emotions you express while doing your job. Like, uh, I don't know, not stabbing a customer with a plastic spork after he asked for some fries with that shake. That's also a thing I feel like in my lifetime, people used to say that. I hope people don't say that anymore, it's not good. And dealing with people who don't respect your work, much less your humanity, makes controlling your emotions really exhausting. And by extra lemon, we mean enough for our waters and then some more. And that's all before COVID restrictions made so much service work invisible. Giving many of us the impression that 32 ounces of Mountain Dew just magically materialized on our porch due to some sort of 7-Eleven sorcery. But I'm sure that's not alienating at all for us to have no idea who, who brings us the things to our house, you know, because then we just don't humanize them. And they're just little little icons on a little app. We just, we just give ratings to them. It's fun. It's going well. It's all going well. So how do we decide service work shouldn't be treated with dignity? Whether it's Uber and Lyft spending over $200 million in marketing, to convince Californians to vote against making their contractors actual employees, or just some guy fuming that his Taco Bell delivery took three minutes longer than estimated. Oh, one second. Uh, sorry guys, uh, I'm gonna take a quick break. My lunch is actually getting delivered right now. Thank you so much. Really appreciate the work that you do. I'll, I'll give you a tip in the app. Oh my God, I'm so excited about... It's not what, it's not what I ordered. It's not what I ordered. Idiots! We're just delivering things now. They don't know what they're doing. And I just need my lunch. Because if I want my lunch, I get cranky. And if I get cranky, the video is bad. And the door goes down. Now, there's always been bummer jobs. But today's service work feels worse. And not just because the Bureau of Labor Statistics found in 2022 that more of those workers were quitting their jobs than in any other industry. Now, this is impossible to contextualize without talking about the time that we all learned that coronavirus isn't what you bring back to your FSU frat house after spring break in Panama City Beach. You get that, Blake? Okay, that's not what it was. That wasn't a funny joke to make. It was a real thing. But I hope you had fun with your cosmic light party or whatever it was. God, I should, I should have been in a frat. It sounds like you guys have so much fun. Because while we were all busy bleaching our groceries, something else was going on. Though platforms like Amazon and Uber Eats had already significantly changed service work, the pandemic turned service staff into essential workers, which for most of them essentially sucked. Now, they were exposed to COVID at high rates, often without PPE protections, much less health insurance, which is of course a privilege, not a right. For the life-threatening risks they took, workers weren't rewarded with better pay, uh, unless you can deposit the sound of, of clanging pots and pans in the bank. Like we literally went from spending every night being like, oh, thank you to everyone to do all this stuff. And now we're just like slapping nurses and delivery drivers like we're a character in Grand Theft Auto. Appreciation for their sacrifice petered out and gave way to an increasingly psychotic post-lockdown public that was suddenly experimenting with everything from verbal to physical assaults, especially when workers were just trying to enforce mask or vaccine mandates. Who are imposing the freedom and the right of an individual, okay? Let me know some of your stories of post-lockdown public insanity 
in the comments. Um, all mine basically involved people acting insane at the movie theater. And I still feel like we haven't gotten back to a good place in terms of going to the movies. So let me know if you want me to make a video series called Michael Teaches You How to Go to the Movies Like a Human. Now, along with pay and your working conditions, this stress contributed to the Great Resignation. When in 2021, burnt out workers quit en masse, 4 million in April alone, the majority working in low paid jobs like retail. Now in one survey, most of these workers said no amount of money would bring them back to the same grind. And you might be thinking, Michael, yeah, but, but a lot has changed since April 2021. Uh, and you're right, you know, I, I started wearing Crocs, uh, had a child, and most importantly, started a Grateful Dead cover band. But one thing that hasn't changed is that even though nobody's refusing anti-vaxxers at brunch, service industry workers attest that customers remain aggressively entitled and confrontational. And we see this in the power of the customer review, whether on Yelp or Google or via actual employer apps like Lyft and DoorDash. The latter of which especially leaves workers forced to placate one customer's moods just for the privilege of being allowed to serve more of them. I mean, actually YouTube's launching a new thing where people get to directly rate hosts on the platforms. So that's pretty exciting. I think someone's gonna pop up at some point and uh, you know, we'll see how I do in this video. I'm not, not really worried. These rating systems lead to misplaced expressions of frustration, like when a delivery driver is delayed due to traffic, but then the restaurant gets one star. Or on the flip side, uh, the delivery driver gets punished uh, for the restaurant's pizza. And these ratings have major consequences. The service industry veteran Genevieve Dahl described the current climate for HuffPost, arguing that people should be downright ashamed to write a negative review. Think about that before you leave that comment, Kyle. She writes that as a result of stress over reviews, colleagues in the service, retail, and hospitality industries have been pushed to their limits. I know of two suicide attempts, six mental health facility check-ins, three denied efforts to check in to a mental health facility due to insurance issues, and countless new antidepressant prescriptions. But reviews aren't the only technology being used to monitor service workers. Amazon drivers are required to take pictures of their deliveries at their busiest selling in over 500 packages to 200 stops a day. Actually, if anyone's an Amazon driver, when you're watching this, does it actually help? There's a thing when you, when you check out at Amazon, I heard from friends, um, that you can click an option where the package shows up later, but it's like less trips or whatever. Does that help? You know, does that help you? Does that help Jeff Bezos? Let us know. And they're penalized or disciplined if they don't finish their daily quota. This leads to skipping state mandated rest breaks, driving unsafely, and again, pissing in bottles. And, and I know it might sound like I'm a little bit obsessed with piss, like I'm just a little bit of a piss freak or something. Piss freak. But people say that trash cans in Amazon Fulfillment centers are regularly filled with bottles of piss. Amazon's tactics are so big brothery that in January of this year, France fined them 32 million euros for excessive worker surveillance, including illegal metrics. In 2021, The Verge reported that Amazon delivery drivers are forced to give biometric consent to being surveilled by AI. It looks for things like yawning or distracted driving, miles driven, speed, acceleration and braking, seatbelt wearing, following distance, and failure to stop at stop signs. And of course, several of these things, you know, like undone seatbelts, uh, speeding or stop sign violations are basically encouraged by the intense time crunch these drivers are under. Despite submitting to these rigorous over surveilled shifts, drivers aren't even considered employees, but contractors lacking any employee benefits. While the great resignation motivated some positive changes, including new worker protections, various union wins, and higher pay for some low wage positions, folks in the industry are still struggling just to get by. And as pandemic stimulus checks and tax credits dried up, those who had quit were forced to return to the same shitty jobs with mostly the same shitty wages. Now in May, 2023, two years out from the supposed worker revolution, the Washington Post reported that service industry workers who comprise 72% of non-farm US jobs remain burned out, underpaid and understaffed while dealing with terrible hours and even worse benefits. Now, speaking of benefits, um, we got a lot of cool benefits over on our Patreon community, which is a great way to support us. Why is my number changing? Because I bet Okay, it was a bad transition, so so I lost some points there. Not a big deal. Uh, a way that you could gain points with us is to sign up for our Patreon. It really is the best way to support our channel. 
Uh, we want to be less dependent on algorithms and advertising. I think you want the same. So you join our community, you get lots of great stuff. You get all our videos early without ads. You get bonus podcast episodes. You get videos where I talk about philosophy, you get on our Discord server, a bunch of other stuff. Uh, it's really great and we're still kind of building it out, adding more levels and more benefits. So might as well get it now. There's a link in the description. And if you, like a lot of workers in America at least, are pretty broke anyways. Uh, we do have a $1 level where you can just throw us a buck a month. Uh, if you do it for a full year, it's like 10 bucks, 80 cents. It still helps us a whole lot. So consider checking that out. And I'm gonna get back to talking about this so I can get my score up. But all of this shouldn't be surprising. The United States is increasingly made up of two groups, the extremely wealthy upper class and what basically amounts to a giant servant class with very little money to burn. Now this has led to a rise in what economist David Otter calls wealth work, i.e. catering to the whims and desires of affluent households. As journalist Derek Thompson writes for The Atlantic, in an age of persistently high inequality, work in high cost metros catering to the whims of the wealthy, grooming them, stretching them, feeding them, driving them, has become one of the fastest growing industries. Now, these jobs range from personal training to life coaching, landscaping to cooking dinner for people, tutoring to walking dogs. And these workers typically earn relatively low wages in fluctuating job markets that depend on client retention. And this is especially true if you're one of the many immigrants doing wealth work whose language skills keep them out of the regular labor market. Due to technological changes, lots of wealth work increasingly means entering the gig economy as an independent contractor without access to employer-provided health insurance or retirement plans. Typically assigned tasks via apps, which often entail traveling to wealthier neighborhoods, these workers are treated as faceless servants, or worse, rabbits. Uh, that's why the, the task rabbit app feels feels weird. I don't, I don't think people should be rabbits. Once I used that app and the guy did like a really bad job, but then I just felt so bad because I'm like, I guess he's not getting paid well and he did a bad job, so what should I do? I'm not gonna give him a bad rating, right? Because I know now I'm really stressed by these ratings. So then I just booked another guy. So then I paid two guys to do the same thing. The second guy did a better job. The second guy was a little weird though. Now the apps designed for convenience have the side effect of concealing the labor that goes into the work itself. A sort of logical conclusion of what Marx identified as the abstraction of labor under industrial capitalism. Wait, I lose points for saying both Marx and capitalism? That doesn't make, make sense to me. I get that we talk about capitalism a lot in Marx law, but it makes sense in this context. So I shouldn't lose, and now I'm losing points for getting worked up. Let me just be happy. While Marx famously wrote about how workers become alienated via the process of production, consumers are equally alienated from the conditions and people that make our stuff. Now guys, not to be a bummer, but if we had to go visit uh, the iPhone factory where these things get made, a lot of us might go back to landlines. And in a similar way, when we order a burrito on our aforementioned iPhones, and then 27 minutes later, it's on our doorstep, we're alienated from the human work that made that food and got it to our door. A scholar Tim Christians writes in his book, Digital Working Lives, this grid of connectivity abstracts from workers' concrete bodies, reducing them into disassembled time fragments that can be composed and recomposed according to unstable market fluctuations. This almost makes being an old-timey butler seem desirable. Now, economist Mark Murrow says, you could argue there was a more benignly human quality to the old aristocratic relationships. Today's platforms stripped down what was once a job into simple, seamless transactions. I guess, at least in the Gilded Age, the serving class maintained some level of intimacy with their employers. Um, and that's not to romanticize a time that was not great, you know, because they, they embraced child labor, they would sometimes murder union leaders, uh, lots of other bad stuff. It's just an example. But it is to say that the new system of apps attach an aura of disposability to members of the servant class because employers don't have the obligation or even the chance to humanize the people cleaning their house or making their food. As Thompson puts it, perhaps the ultimate price of wealth work for all of the opportunities for the low skilled is not only the threat of exploitation, but broader alienation. In a digital marketplace of maximal convenience, there is no room for the friction of intimacy. Nice, I, I like to leave some room for the friction of intimacy, if you know what I mean. Well, I was, I was, 
I don't know why I'm losing points for that. I don't think it's immature. We were all thinking it. Everyone was thinking friction, intimacy. Everyone thought it. And then I say it and I lose. Okay. And now I'm losing points again for my anger. Okay. Um, okay. Just get centered. Just get centered. Just get centered. Describing his immersive experience researching service work within the gig economy, scholar Eric M. Anisich argues that what I observed and experienced was a system that suppresses workers' uniqueness, experiences, and future aspirations. It was a system that treated people like lines of code to be deployed instead of humans to be developed. Or as one Uber contractor told him, the driver is invisible. The driver doesn't exist. It's like you're not really there. Anisich concludes that the depersonalization of app workers is a feature, not a bug, of a system that doesn't protect employees. A system that uses technology and surveillance to organize them, which increasingly leaves workers isolated from one another, from customers, and even from themselves. We see this type of dehumanization on full display in a recent graduate thesis in which the author posits that perhaps we can evoke empathy in consumers by sending them live heart rate data from the e-bikers delivering their food. Because if you know that the person delivering your food has a heart rate, then, then you might want to might take care of them a little more. Um, that's, that's just dark. That's dark. You know, points for ingenuity, but if we need biometrics to provoke a kernel of empathy, then my friends, things are, are, are not going well. Now, the future of labor as it stands is liable to be one where we don't think about the sore back of the chef who's stirring your delicious green curry. One where our Uber driver's wrong left turn is punished with a potentially job-ending one-star review. All that is to say that as life becomes more convenient, empathy might become harder to find. Oh, thank you for the, okay, the rating's going up. I think some of you are feeling some empathy for me now. I really appreciate it. One 2011 study found that between 1979 and 2009, America's average level of empathic concern, i.e. sympathy for someone else's struggles, fell by 48%. This period also happens to be when neoliberalism really took off in America. I just got back up, I didn't, I just said neoliberalism. It's it's a thing that happens in the world. We gotta talk about it. I don't know. I'll get it back. Stats like this led sociologist Luigi Esposito to conclude in 2016 that as the unfettered pursuit of profit and self-gain under neoliberalism is celebrated as synonymous with freedom, a predatory mindset is promoted that dissolves democratic social bonds and encourages people to overlook one another's humanity. And there's a good possibility this kind of predatory mindset could define the future of labor, even for those of us who aren't trying to hack it as an on-demand repair technician or a freelance dog walker. In one survey, more than 50% of executives and senior managers said they're likely to significantly increase their reliance on digital talent platforms. There, they'll inevitably find a global network of independent contractors doing white-collar tasks that once amounted to high-income jobs. Anisich observes that from this perspective, the 40 million Americans who have rented out their services to technology platforms like Uber, Lyft, and DoorDash may be canaries in the coal mine of the new world of work. What they experience today, millions more are likely to experience in some form in the future. In other words, pretty soon it won't just be delivery drivers and dog walkers relying on apps and contract labor to make ends meet. It will be most, if not all of us. So, in conclusion, uh, don't be an asshole and, uh, and please tip the hell out of your waiters and delivery drivers and, and try to order from places that, that use their own services. Um, and because the gig economy is such a rough game to play, uh, if you want to know more about it, click here and check out a full video we made about how the gig economy emerged. In the meantime, please let me know what you think in the comments, and I would love to hear about any of your experiences uh, with this type of service industry labor. And a huge thanks to all of you for watching, for hanging out, for liking, subscribing. You know, be sure to ring the bells and all that sort of stuff. If you want to hang out more, uh, I'm streaming every Monday and Wednesday, 10 a.m. Pacific time, right here on the channel. Would love to have you. We have a great chat, get into a lot of fun stuff. Uh, and of course, thank you so much to all of our patrons. If you're interested, there's a link in the description. You get lots of great perks, and it is a huge help to our whole team. So think about doing it, maybe. Uh, and in the meantime, I hope that my rating goes up a bit so that I can see you again. Because like I said, I have no idea what happens if it gets any lower. I'll see you later, I hope.